So Dennis, you'll have to unmute yourself. A little, a little thing, a little, a little icon down in the bottom of the, of your screen. Just wave your cursor over the bottom of the screen, and you'll find a thing that says mute, unmute. Just drag your cursor along the along the bottom of the bottom of the screen. You should get a bunch of of little icons that pop up. So Mary, un, 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 unmute us uh, unmute us all, just so Dennis can make a few comments. No. Well, I'll tell you what, I hope, hopefully you can figure it out as the meeting goes along and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get back to you later then. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and introduce our, uh, our guest speakers tonight um, and we'll do, we'll do our regular programming first. Um, so uh, tonight is tonight's going to be something a little bit different. We're going to focus. Um, we, you know, we've gotten uh, as 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 this just proves, not everybody is totally familiar uh, with uh, with online things. But uh, hopefully, by the end of the evening, we'll have a little more taste of of what's out there on the internet, and specifically um, a, uh, a an internet uh, uh, site uh, that started out as a YouTube show. Uh, called Badgerland Birdie. And with us tonight, we have brothers uh, Derek and Ryan Salmon. Um, and uh, their goal is to spread knowledge about birds and other animals that live not only in Wisconsin, but all across the United States. Um, and I'm gonna let uh, Ryan and Derek tell you the rest uh, and uh, let them share their screen and their program with us tonight. You wanna do the share? All right. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for having us. We really appreciate uh, you guys opening up your bird club to us and uh, what we have to say. Um, so can everybody see that? Carl, can you see it? Looks good to me. All right, perfect. Um, so the title of our presentation is The Changing World of Birding. So as people yep. that are on the younger yes, side... Um, I think, screen looks good. Okay, sweet. Um, I think we have kind of an interesting perspective on what birding is like now. And we kind of know a little bit about what it used to be, but we do see it making a change from this uh, hobby and pastime that was once very much not having anything to do with online and not super connected to something that is getting very connected and is now all of a sudden found a new home online for things like sightings and the way that people go about the hobby. So uh, some of the things that we're going to discuss tonight, if we can get the slide to change, um, is how we got involved in birding personally, how the past time of birding has changed um, in the past couple of years until now, some of the changing things that we think will be coming into the future of birding, and then some changes in the ranges of birding. So just going over a lot of different things discussing where birding might be going, where it's been, and where we are at right now with uh, the hobby as a whole. So how we got into birding, because this is one of the most common questions that we get asked is uh, what in essentially sparked your interest in birds and birding. Um, for us, like most people, there was 
that initial interest in animals altogether, and then that interest in birds specifically. And for uh, Derek and I, a lot of this came from our grandparents' house where they had this big window in the back where you could just sit and look out at the uh, animals back there. And there were a certain number of feeders out there and a certain types of birds that would always come to the feeders. So we would see what was coming and we would get excited about some of the ones that weren't super common, but that would make an appearance. So you can see we have the red breasted nuthatch on there, which is uh, perfect because we were talking about that one that was being carved. Um, it was one of the birds that was common enough that we would see it, but not common enough that we would ever get tired of it. So that kind of sparked like, oh, there's some stuff out there that you don't get to see very often, kind of the aspect of rarities and birds and things. Um, and then as kids, we also just explored nature as a whole. Our mom raised caterpillars. Um, into butterflies and moths. We were always interested in things like snakes and turtles and frogs. And so as a whole, that kind of set the stage for us as uh, birders later on. And at that point in our lives, we didn't even know that birding was actually a thing. And our first introduction to it was really when the movie The Big Year came out. And of course, it's the most famous, I would say, movie that involves birding. But I remember, I think it was when I was in college, it was on TV and our mom was like, hey, there's some movie about birds on if you want to watch it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I guess I'll watch that. And then for what it was, like a movie with Jack Black, Steve Martin, and Owen Wilson in it, three people that are very well known in the film industry and as comedians. And then this idea of them having a competition about birding and to see who can see the most birds was very exciting to us at the time because we had no idea this thing existed, this competition to see birds and seeing it portrayed on the screen with the adventures that they were having and the things that they got out of it was what really kind of led us to the next step of maybe this is something that we would get involved in. And I think that some other things set the stage for us in this regard, such as Pokemon, which was something really popular when we were in grade school and is still somewhat popular today, but it's based on bug collecting was essentially where it got its start. And um, for those of you not super familiar with Pokemon, it was basically a world where there was imaginary creatures and people that were trainers that would go and collect them. Very similar to how birders go and collect species for their list or collect photos of species. And this came in the form of a TV show all about going and searching the globe to find these Pokemon um, video games where you did the same thing, a card game. And uh, some of these Pokemon were actually basically just birds. So you see two of them on the screen. One of them is very much to me looks like a house sparrow and the character would go out and try to catch them. Um, but to me, it was very similar to what birding was. So when I was like, you go around and you find different species of birds and you either collect them on your list or take a picture. Like that was something I was very familiar with from this Pokemon thing that we did when we were younger. Did you do anything to add? I was just going to say a lot of the Pokemon are based on animals. So I think especially there was like 50 original ones that came out with and most of them were based on some kind of animal. So they definitely steal from the natural world. Like there's one that literally is basically just a barn swallow. I think it's called like Swellow. Yeah. <laughs> so they're literally just taking from the real animal kingdom and putting it into this form that um, people really really enjoyed yeah so we were totally primed without knowing it for birding with all of this stuff that happened when we were little kids essentially with just the connection in nature and then this sort of thing happening too with the popular uh or popularity of pokemon let's go to the next one so when we found out that there was something called a big year of course being like young somewhat ignorant people who are also very competitive the first thing i did was look and see if there was a record for the big year in Wisconsin because I was like birding is probably something that like almost nobody does so there's probably like I could really probably very easily go and like find enough birds to get a big year record in Wisconsin and so I reached out to I think somebody from the WSO and I was like hey just curious uh what's the record for the big year in Wisconsin I expect it to be like you know 60 or 100 because I had no idea what kind of species were out there and I remember the person came back they're like oh I think the record is like 360 like eight or something like that um, roughly. And I was like, that was the first time I was like, oh, wow, there's a lot more out there than I was even aware of to begin with. And we tried to have this sort of like big year anyway. And we had no idea what we were doing. So we were learning on the fly. Yeah. I would say, like, if you're thinking about the like scientific method perspective, this was like the exploratory phase of like, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we wanted to go out and do it. And so we had the little like stand tequila birds of Wisconsin, like blue book. And it had the range maps where it showed like, oh, winter, this is supposed to be here. So we'd look in the book, 
you're gonna say like oh pine gross beak should be in wisconsin so we yeah like out. the rain showed that it was in so wisconsin. we go out in winter and we just go in the woods and be like why aren't there any pine gross beaks here it doesn't make any sense yeah we're like where could all this stuff be and <laughs> it took uh, a lot of trial and error and research to figure out that this stuff is all based on habitat but it was funny with that book too because we were not into going to look for birds nor did we know how to do it before this so some of the stuff that's really common that we see all the time now and we're like oh there's one of those to us at the time was super cool to see so like one of them that we don't have on this list but i remember is coots like before we were interested in birding we would look at that book and we're like man wouldn't it be cool to see a coot like look at that thing it's so weird i've never seen one of those and now of course that we're actual birders we see coots all the time we're like oh there's another coot one of uh thousands we've seen today but some of the experiences that we had during that year just reinforced the idea that birding was something really fun for us to do. Um, so the common golden eye we saw at a park in Waukesha where we both uh, grew up. And it was like this moment where, wow, I can't believe this thing's actually here. Like we yeah, haven't seen this I ever before. it was before. one of my favorite moments because that first year we were keeping a list of everything. And like um, we were at Frame Park in Waukesha and we were looking at all the ducks and then we saw this common gold and I was like, oh, we've never seen anything like that before. Like We got like we had legitimately to excited it was. about it, I think. Yeah, because it was just like... so cool. It was something like I'd never looked at Frame Park in the middle of winter because I never had a reason to, but like just looking for birds. I think later that year we went to Lake Michigan. I was like, they're everywhere yeah. <laughs> like in the winter. Um, there were some other moments too, like we encountered a red-shouldered hawk in the middle of winter um, down in the Calmarain State Forest, which shows we didn't know what it was or that it was kind of rare for the area. And uh, that was also my first introduction to eBird because I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm going to try to eBird that. So I just eBirded it like without any info on it. I was like, yeah, I saw a red-shouldered hawk. And then the e uh, eBird reviewer was like, did you actually see a red-shouldered red hawk? Um, and we did. We and we did. Yeah, that's nice, a photo. But yeah. Um, then we had a couple other really cool finds. There was the cheer falcon that a lot of you may remember was at Buena Vista Grasslands that year. So we went and saw that. It was cool and an adventure. And then one of the uh, most memorable adventures that we had, I think, was going to Devil's Lake to look for the towns in solitaire. Because much like the movie The Big Year, where there's a struggle and adventure and then ultimately a payoff, that's what it was like looking for the towns in solitaire. We had never seen one before. Uh, we didn't really know what to expect, but we climbed that bluff at Devil's Lake and we're all tired and um, have no idea how to find this bird. And the snow is starting to fall lightly. There's uh, glistening off of the snowflakes dead in the air. Dead silent. Yeah, dead silent. And all of a sudden this little gray bird just swoops down, pops up on a branch. Um, Derek takes a picture of it and it's this picture I still really like. It was with like, what camera was it? The Panasonic Lumix 60 times zoom? DMCFZ70. Yeah, so he takes a picture of it and you can see the little glistening snowflakes. And to me, it just personified the essence of what birding is, which is going through a struggle to find something and having the ultimate natural reward of this beautiful moment kind of preserved and captured in time. Just kind of going off that too, I think one of my favorite things about birding is also you can do it to whatever degree you want. Like if you want to do it from your backyard and just look at what's in your bird feeders, like that's great. If you want to go crazy and do a listing thing, that's also great. Like it can really be whatever you want it to be. So depending on how much time and how intense you want to be with it, it, it can really fit into whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that first year also, we experienced that it's kind of interesting to be a younger person and to be a birder. So we went to this outing that was called a Swift's Night Out in Lake Geneva. And I remember after the presentation, which was about kestrels and their decline and what we can do to help them. And then also about chimney swifts, the person that was leading the presentation kind of pulled us aside after is like, hey, come here for a second. And I was like, oh, what's going on? And he was just like, thank you for being young and being interested in birds. And I was like, okay, maybe like that's kind of a strange thing to be younger and be interested in birds because the uh, perception of birding was it was something mostly for the older community. Um, and I think when we got into birding, we found out that that is somewhat the case. Like a lot of the younger people we know say, you know, there's not many people that are younger and into birding. And we were actually at Horicon Marsh two days ago and we ran into someone from Washington and she was around our age. And even she was like, wow, it's nice to see young people birding like me because there's nobody younger in Washington. And I mean, that's not a good thing or a bad thing, but there's definitely that perception that most of the birding community is older and it's something you do when you're retired. Mm -hmm. Did you, you well, know? I was just going to say like everybody we met through birding, I don't think there's been anyone we've met who's just been a jerk. Like everyone's been super yeah. nice and wanting to spread knowledge and like kind of share the joy of birding. And like, I think that's another part that's really cool is because it's just um 
it's brought us to so many cool places that it's really nice to share that with other people. Like I remember um, I saw a lady who was looking for Northern Perula. And like, at this point, like I learned what the call was. I'm like, you know, they're everywhere. It's like, I helped her find her in Northern Perula. And then she posted on Facebook later, like her picture of it. And they're like, oh, thanks for like helping me find it. I'm like, that was like just a really cool moment. Yeah, but um, you see the pie chart that we have on the right there, the percent of away from home wildlife watchers by age. You can see just how half of that pie is essentially taken up by people that are 45 and over, which is really interesting. Um, but we are starting to see more young people get involved with it now. So we have kind of our friends that are around our age that bird and we're getting more people into birding that are around our age and you're sort of seeing um, it become more of a mainstream thing for people who are a little bit younger as well as people that are a little bit older too. So what we learned from that first year is that birds are often habitat dependent. So we finally figured out that just because the range of a bird is in our area doesn't mean it's going to be in the exact habitat we're looking at. There are different styles of birding. So as Derek mentioned, some people really want the photography aspect and they'll go sit all day for one picture of a bird. Some people want to chase the rarities. Some people want to find out what's nesting in their area. Um, in that same vein, each birder has different goals, whether it's to win a big year, whether it's to just get as many birds from their home as possible, from their patch as possible, whether it's to document breeding of so many birds. The big green big year. Whether it's a big green big year. We even ran into somebody who's telling us a story about someone that kept a list of birds they saw from their bathroom. So apparently they had a window in their bathroom. So they had like a bathroom life list of birds that they saw from there. And there are so many ways to get involved with birding as well. So the Christmas bird counts, the breeding bird atlas, a listing photography. There really is something for everybody, which we thought was really cool. Um, so this kind of brings us to how we talk about how birding has changed over the years. And I'm sure most people are familiar with the way birding started, which was the competitive killing of birds known as a side hunt, which took place um, back in the day until ornithologists, one of which was Frank Chapman, most famously, decided that for the conservation of birds, it would be much better to count them instead of kill them. And that's how we got the Christmas bird count. And then the Christmas bird count sort of evolved into a thing that became more of a hobby where people year round decided to count birds. And uh, it kind of took off from there as time went on. So one thing that's very notable in the birding community is the tech that's associated with the hobby. So binoculars are very common, but now also getting involved with scopes and then cameras. And I think that the camera aspect is particularly important for birding nowadays because it's something that brings people from other hobbies into birding specifically. So I know a lot of people that started out taking pictures and then after a while they kind of go away from the taking the pictures and they just are interested in the birds. Um, we know a guy actually who's another YouTuber named Stefano who does wildlife photography in general and now he is very much interested in the birds specifically in that photography. Uh, but we found that the cameras were really integral in our learning because um, that's one thing we get asked a lot too is in our videos, we never have binoculars with us because we just started out with a camera, zooming in, taking a picture of the bird and then identifying it right there. So we don't usually carry bird books. We don't carry binoculars. It's just camera, see what it is, take the picture, identify if we weren't sure what it was just by listening to it or looking at it. But we found out that it was just easier to be able to take that still shot and then look at it later and identify it and say, okay, that's what that was, as opposed to trying to figure it out in the field, especially some of these birds like warblers, sparrows, wrens that you may not get a good look at if you don't capture that one moment. Yeah, because with binoculars, you might have it just for a second in your binoculars till it's gone. But if you have it for a second in your camera, you can either take a video and take like a still shot from it or snap a picture real quick and then you have it. Yeah. And I, I really liked that aspect of it. Yeah, and I would say it's not anything that I would endorse doing over binoculars, but it's just kind of funny how uh, everyone asks us about it because it's not something that's familiar to most people. But the technological advances in birding, I think are making it way more accessible. And there's uh, some of the other ones too that have come out recently that we'll talk about too. Um, so did you want to go over the cameras we use? I feel like sure. you get that question so more. So we started using the Panasonic Lumix DMC FZ70. And so it has a 60 time opt optical zoom and then a 60 time digital zoom. So you can get really close up views of things. And we found it was really useful um, just, you know, for if you're not very close to something for being able to at least get a picture and identify it. And so we started off with the 70, then we switched to the 80, which is the newer version. 
Uh, the 70, I thought, took better pictures, honestly, but the 80, I think, is much better video quality. The 70 also had a better windscreen. So for some reason, they put a worse windscreen on the 80. The windscreen now is horrible. Yeah, so if there's any mild wind, it's just like you can't hear anything. So we actually started using, um, I actually have a Nikon D5300 camera that has an external mic, and we use that more for like video blogging or for taking videos of herself. And then we'll use the DMC FZ80 um, for the bird videos, but I normally use a tripod with it too. So we've been, you know, getting more into that stuff kind of as we go. And, uh, like Ryan said earlier, we just kind of got used to using the camera. We liked being able to have evidence and take pictures of stuff. And- Actually, the evidence was kind of important, especially when you're on the younger side, people don't always, uh, think that you know what you're doing yeah well i think it's the same for anything it's like you know even with the ivory build woodpecker people like oh i saw one it's like well where's the picture like you almost need to have a picture now to prove prove yourself because cameras are so accessible or like sasquatch settings you know it's like well i saw it like where's the picture clearly it doesn't even matter because you can take a video and it could be a hoax (laughs) your hoax and ivory build woodpeckers (laughs) um but something that's changed the game drastically too is things moving online in terms of listing things so people only used to have the option really of having a paper list keeping it in a binder or a spiral or a notebook and it was almost impossible to filter through that into any sort of statistical breakdown so it was kind of like you could keep a list of what you've seen in your entire life you could keep a list of what you've seen in your county in your state but there was no really accessible quick way to get that info and one of the things that's been a game changer, of course, has been eBird. So eBird, I'm sure most people probably are familiar with it or use it, but you can put in all of your sightings and then you can find out almost any data from it. So what species you've seen worldwide, what species you've seen in your state and your county. And then there's some other sites too that are like this for not only birding, but other types of nature. So iNaturalist is one that we've put in insect sightings into before. Birds you can do as well. Um, anything like fish, um, reptiles, amphibians. It's kind of crazy how the info can all get stored that you gather. So it's just made it so much easier to find out what you've been doing and to look at the stats. And I think that this is attractive to people too that are more competitive because then like right at your fingertips, you know how many birds you've seen. There's even the section where you can find out who's the top in your area or your state or your county. You can also just search a bird that you're looking for and see where it's been reported. And so I find that's really useful if you want to know where the closest point someone's seen a red breasted not hatch in the past three months. You can mm-hmm. just search it and it'll tell you. Or even hot spots. Like if you're just going, you know, on a trip somewhere like out to Boston, you can look at any of the hot spots. You can see what's been yeah. seen there recently. I've, and I'm assuming everyone's probably pretty familiar with eBird, but just if you're not, the basic idea idea is you make a checklist for a certain location. You input the species you saw, you put in the time you were out there, and then you submit it, and then it saves it. And you can even look at like a county map of where you saw species in a certain county, how many species have you seen like for your life list. It really breaks down to a lot of statistics, Um, probably things that like you never knew you were even interested in. Yeah, exactly. Um, Because like I have friends now that want to get a bird in every county in a certain state. Or like a picture of every single bird that they've seen. So one of our friends is like, he went back and downloaded a list of all the birds he needed to take a picture of that he's seen already. Now he always messages our bird group and is like, I got, you know, this one that I didn't, and it's always something in common. He's just like, it turns out it didn't have barn swallow. And now yeah, well, some of them it's like, you wouldn't think to add and because you can add photos and videos to the data, of course, too. But yeah, it's really useful. I use the Macaulay library actually to basically store photos mm-hmm. and then go and download them for our videos later, which is really convenient. Um, one other part of the internet too that's made birding much more interesting is that it's made everybody a little bit more connected than they used to be. So talking about how maybe back you know, 20 years ago, it was all bird clubs. And if you weren't in a bird club, you might not ever encounter anybody else who was birding. Um, one of our friends who's now an eBird reviewer said that he had birded ever since he was a kid, but it took him until he was like 13 years old, I think, to find anybody else that actually birded in his area. And I think that that wouldn't really happen nowadays because of how readily available the bird info is on Facebook or um, on some of those apps where you can communicate with each other, like messengers and stuff like that. 
but it's really easy now to find other bird enthusiasts. So one of the first things that we did when we started was we joined that. Uh, I think at the time when we joined, there was Birding Wisconsin and Wisconsin Birding. On Facebook. On Facebook, Facebook yeah. And then there was the Wisconsin Rare Bird Alert. And it made it so much easier to find the information you're looking for, to find other people or to see pictures. And now that's one of the primary ways people communicate that information. Um, I know back when birding wasn't as heavily involved in technology from what we've heard from other people is that there used to actually be a hotline that you'd call and find info on rare birds that way. So you'd have to call in and they would give you the info back, uh, just like it's seen in the big year. But in addition to the Facebook, now you also have the email list. So we're part of the listserv that sends out info um, online via email. And then there's also things like GroupMe that people have started where it's just so easy to post a sighting. Then within 10 minutes, people are already there looking at whatever rare bird it was. Yeah, GroupMe is basically just like another messaging platform, mm -hmm. kind of like a group text. Yeah, I think we've seen it most recently in our state with the snowy plover probably mm -hmm. was that as soon as that came out, that one was there all of a sudden within minutes, people were out looking for it. So without that people may never have known that that was there until it came out in some form of print later or yeah. just spread slowly over time through bird clubs and individual people um so how we got started doing what we're doing and having a youtube channel and trying to spread information is we noticed that on these groups on facebook and things like that there were a ton of photos of birds but there weren't a whole lot of videos of birds and there weren't a whole lot of videos of birds in a digestible format that you could follow along with it. And um, I think that this was partially a divide of generations where birding hadn't caught on yet in any sort of media that was easily digestible other than photos. So a lot of people were really interested in the photos, but there just wasn't anything that was video related that was telling any kind of story. So we saw that this was an interesting way that we could expand and spread the knowledge of birds we acquired and spread our enthusiasm of the birds that we acquired to other people that may not be able to see the ones that we saw. So with that, we started Badgerland Birding in 2016. Um, we just one day were like, let's try to make a YouTube series. About yeah, there birds. were there were like a ton of fishing channels on YouTube that were like, oh, I'm going bass fishing. Like, let's see what I catch. And they chronicled the guy's bass fishing adventures and it had like a hundred thousand views so we're like well let's make kind of a birding vlog video blog series where it basically just is what it is we decide we're going to go look for a certain species we take you on the adventure with us um we talk about species we find along the way give you some facts about them and then we you know conclude the adventure and go on to the next one so we have um, those types of videos we make, we also do ID tips videos of like purple finch versus house finch, um, neotropic versus double crested cormorant. Blue grows begin to go bunting. Yeah, just some species that are tough to find. And we've also started doing some live streaming, talking about different topics and also kind of an interview series uh, with specialists in the field. We did one with um, winter finch expert Matt Young, who started the Finch Research Network with some colleagues. Um, Matt Miller, head of science communication for the Nature Conservancy. And uh, we've also collaborated with some other YouTubes, YouTubers too. So uh, since then, we have over 3,250 subscribers, over 12.5K hours of watch time. And uh, we've also gotten some popular videos from it as well. I feel like our first videos were like kind of goofy too and not well put together. And it really evolved from there into like at first we were just kind of like, let's do it to make videos. And it'll just be something fun that we can spread around and remember our, our bird trips by. And then slowly over time, we started to get invites to speak at bird clubs and we started to get invites to lead bird walks and we got invites to collaborate with people and it sort of changed into more than just this video series. It sort of became like its own thing, I would say. Yeah. And also I think um, definitely like the quality of the episodes gotten better. Like I think each new episode we make is the best one we've ever done. And if I go back and look at the first one, it's hard to watch because like our theme songs all kind of janky and then like, the camera work isn't great and our narration is pretty bad. So it's, it's like, I definitely think you want to keep thinking the latest thing you did is the best one. Hopefully it's not like the other way around, but yeah, it's definitely evolving. I use the tripod a lot more for bird videos too. Yeah. But I would say the goal still remains the same, which is kind of let people in on our adventures. Like mm -hmm. some of the places that we've gone, you know, people may not have gone to who watch us. So like Oklahoma, we went to a couple places that are, like hotspots for birding and 
we've made some videos about where to go if you bird Horicon Marsh or where to go if you bird other areas that are popular. So I think that our goal is still kind of remain the same, even though we've gotten bigger. And then, like I said, here's our official um, mission statement. So our mission to spread knowledge about birds presented in an entertaining way. We aim to use media to spark interest in the general public to learn more about birds and wildlife conservation. So the key word there, to me at least, is that we're using media to do it. So we're not just going around and talking all the time. We're trying to do it with our videos to showcase um, birding kind of moving into the modern era, I would say. Yeah, and I think really just showcase it in the way that it really is. Because I think when we stumbled into birding, I kind of think of it as this hidden gem hobby because like nothing when I was younger was telling me, hey, go try birding. It's this fun adventure. Yeah. Like there was nothing really like that. So I think even just getting people more into it, like we have friends who've come with us on birding trips and they're like, wow, this is really fun. Like, and they kind of get into it themselves and then they'll like get more into photography. They'll be going out themselves and they'll find new stuff. And I think recently I've actually had a lot of younger people reach out to us and just be like really excited about what we're doing. So, well, they're probably excited they found other people similar to them now. Which yeah, is part, but like part of why of them it's so are connected. Out there and, yeah, and connecting. In yeah, that way. definitely. And here's some of the places that we traveled to that we've made some videos about. Um, so you see, this is one of my, I think it's my eBird map or is it your eBird? It's your eBird map because mm -hmm. it has Louisiana on it. Um, but you can see that big red spot in Wisconsin. And then California, Derek went to, he made a really cool video about the parrots that live in the Pasadena area. Uh, we hit the Saxon bog and made a couple of videos there. We have Florida, South Carolina, most recently Oklahoma, Texas. And then Derek, um, since he goes to grad school in Louisiana is there. But um, yeah, we've really expanded beyond what we did when we started. And then uh, we're going to talk now a little bit about where we see birding going in the future with some of the technological advancements that we might see down the pipeline going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, I feel like we I've seen a lot more articles about quote unquote prodigy birders or young birders that are um, kind of being highlighted in different magazines and articles. So there was an article I found about Ethan Ellis, um, who said birding is something we started doing together. He's talking about him and his dad. Um, and he says, I spot them and he helps me by taking pictures. So father and son working together there, birding duo. Uh, this was in Gazebo News. So they said, are you an expert in other subjects or is it just birding? That's your area of expertise. He said he also draws birds. He's good at math. He likes to play oboe in the bassoon, but he spent about 5,000 hours bird watching and studying birds. So I know other people we talked to said if they were a birder when they were young, they felt like they may have been like ridiculed or, or bullied. But now I think it's something that's really being praised, especially as we see more interest in conservation and conservation science in general. I kind of thought that I would get bullied more when I started birding. Well, you haven't been. So. <laughs> yeah, most people are just like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so this article went further. They said, do you know other uh, young people who are into birding? Are you a rare bird yourself uh, being a young expert? And he said, it's kind of rare for a child to be into birding, but I know several other young bird watchers. Bird watching is one of the most popular hobbies in the United States, but most bird watchers are older. So that's kind of reinforcing what we talked about. And I do believe bird watching is the number one fastest growing outdoor activity in the moment. So mm -hmm. definitely seeing more people taking interest in the hobby. So as far as the future of birding, there's been some cool developments with call recognition apps being known as the Shazam for birds. Shazam is an app where you, if you hear a song playing, you open Shazam and it'll tell you the name of the song. And so um, there's also been Merlin Bird ID and people are kind of using apps as opposed to field guides. So we did a video testing for Bird ID photo apps. So the, those are apps that you download on your phone. You take a picture of the bird and it's supposed to tell you what kind of bird it is. And we found it's very dependent on the quality of the photo that you take. There was one app that was just absolutely terrible and couldn't identify Smart like anything co correctly. Uh, but apps like Merlin, if you give them a good photo and you give them the correct location, they're fairly good at identifying it. But still, I feel like experts are better than uh, relying on technology, but it can also help you narrow down your choices. That call recognition thing recently, I think, got added recently, to it. Recently, it Merlin to? added the Merlin. call ID feature. There's also another one called BirdNet that I'm actually going to open right now. So um, it's an app where you open it, you download and open it on your phone. It just kicked me out, so we'll um, get back into it. So the thing with BirdNet is you open it, it has your location, you hit record and it actually shows you a spectrogram. So if you hear a bird call, it'll show you like where the notes are in it. 
then you can highlight the call you want it to ID. You hit analyze and it'll give you like what it thinks it is. And so I was actually out the other day and it correctly identified Indigo Bunting call, Eastern Tohi call, and Song Sparrow call. So I think that's a really cool one because personally, I feel like I'm a lot better at IDing birds visually. So it's cool to have an app where if you just hear it, and sometimes it really bothers you. We're like, man, I know what that, mm -hmm. it's like, I know I've heard that before. I just want to know what it is. And then I can tell you, and you'd be like, oh yeah, it's such and such call. So te technology is coming a long way as far as um, assisting with birding. But I know other people have all said that takes some of the like joy out of it, of searching for well, it, it yourself. Well, it takes some of the challenge it. away from it. And it, it may lead to like less knowledge overall on the people that are doing it. But it's definitely you know? some interesting developments going on. Uh, this is another one called Song Sleuth that kind of works uh, in a similar way that was tested. And someone said, for all the science behind it, I found it straightforward and convenient. Even for a beginner birder like me, I immediately liked the fact I didn't need Wi-Fi or data to use it. So um, in the middle there, that's an example of what kind of the spectrogram looks like where you can see the different calls and then you isolate and then it gives you some options. So I think that's part of why we've seen a rise of beginner birders, not necessarily even young birders, just beginner birders is because now there's all these things that help you when you're just getting started. So it's not like you have to all of a sudden pour over the books to figure out what lives in your area or what you've been seeing. Now it's as simple as taking a picture on your phone and then getting kind of an instant Yeah, you can answer. almost kind of dive in right away and then kind of learn. Mm -hmm. Where before I feel like you needed to learn before you kind of dived in. And how many people have we met where they're just like, yeah, I started birding this year and, you know, I well, we'll downloaded talk, everything. We'll talk a little bit about possibly why in a couple of slides. But I also want to talk about um, shifting baseline syndrome, which is the idea where the world you grew up in, you assume that that's been the world forever. And so we'll go through this quote real quick saying it's the situation which over time knowledge is lost about the state of the natural world because people don't perceive changes that are taking place. In this way, people's perceptions of change are out of kilter with the actual changes taking place in the environment. And so this is kind of um, a graph. You don't have to read everything on it, but it's just kind of saying as time goes on, people perceive what's going on in their world as how it's always been. And so we see this a lot with um diversity of birds like we read reports from like when was that crazy Wisconsin i think it was like only like 20 or 30 years ago yeah long from ago. a little while ago where people just say yeah there were like thousands of birds here now it's really dwindled different species like in wisconsin like little blue herons i remember it says i went to my reliable little blue heron spot as if there was something that's there all the time and we can't even imagine you know, having a little blue hair and spot. Right. In also with birds like the passenger pigeon, where you hear stories about flocks going over your head for hours and hours, and then they're just gone. And so like us not growing up with passenger pigeons, we just assume it's normal. But to people who lived generations back, it'd be crazy that they're not here anymore. I think a good example too is sandhill cranes and bald eagles, mm -hmm. but in a more positive way where a lot of people remember sandhill cranes and bald eagles being very rare so they still are like an exciting thing to see whereas for us it's like yeah it's a bald eagle it's a sandhill crane we see thousands it's exciting it's just <laughs> in a different way it's not as exciting but if we saw something that was more rare now all of a sudden we would still probably think it was incredible when mm -hmm. other people in the next generation would yeah not. additionally we want to talk about the impact of uh, the coronavirus on birding because during the lockdowns when people weren't allowed to really be in groups we saw a lot of people pick this up as a new hobby because it was something you could do outdoors while social distancing, while being away from people. The, and so I think we will see a rise in the amount of new birders um, that we see as a result of the coronavirus. Um, so there was an article that said, the birds are not on lockdown, more people are watching them, saying bird watching has surged in popularity during the pandemic. It's easy to start, you can do it anywhere, even from inside and even in urban spaces as well. Mm -hmm. And that was when we'd really see a lot of the people. Yeah, because when we <laughs> we did a lot of started. birding uh, during kind of the like COVID stuff because we, you know, we're not bothering anyone out there by ourselves. Um, but we'd meet a lot of people um, later on that would be like, yeah, I just started because of COVID. I needed something to do. And then uh, someone stated there was often, you know, a certain individual bird that would get you into it. People refer to it as like a spark bird or something like that. And this was in reference to the Scarlet Tanager. said the Scarlet Tanager is one that gets a lot of people into it because you got to know, what is that thing? I like, love it's that just quote. a beautiful bird. <laughs> um, I know peregrine falcons have been that bird for other people, you know, like scissor tail flycatchers, a lot of the really Orioles. unique species, Orioles. 
Um, maybe the red breast did not hatch for you. So additionally, uh, in regards to shifting baseline syndrome, we've lost a lot of the birds that we used to have. So in the last 100 years, 2.9 billion breeding adult birds have been lost from the US and Canada. Um, Dark-eyed junco, something that we see is fairly common and stable, has lost around 175 million individuals from the population. White-throated sparrows have lost 93 million. And it's hard to even comprehend these numbers when this they're just so huge. You just kind of read it as a number, but it's a pretty insane amount when you mm -hmm. think about it. Um, additionally, we've lost more than a quarter of our birds since 1970. We've lost a billion birds, a forest birds since 1970. Grassland birds saw 53% reduction. Aerial insectivores are down 32%. Uh, coastal shorebirds lost more than one third of their population. And then the volume of spring migration measured by radar dropped as well in the last decade. So um, one of the main things we're seeing is, of course, habitat loss is a big has had a big effect on birds. Um, people having their cats outside is, of course, kind of a pain that also kills a lot of songbirds. And um, also we're looking at window strikes and then invasive species, window collisions, uh, pesticide use, and of course the number one habitat loss or habitat degradation. So some things that people can do to help birds are of course keeping your cats indoors, using native plants, avoiding using pesticides. Um, this list has drinking shade grown coffee as one of theirs. So a little outside the box helps. there, allegedly <laughs> it helps. Um, reducing plastic use, doing citizen science like reporting the eBird and then um, you know, putting markers on your windows to prevent window strikes. There have been some changes in bird ranges in recent years as well. Uh, for example, we have the evening grosbeak range map from 1989 to 1994, and then from 2001 to 2006, we're seeing their range actually push more northernly. And talking with Matt Young, our finch expert, he seems to think that a lot of this is because of the spruce budworm control that is being done um, in kind of the like, Canadian forests and the northern U.S. that they're not finding as much to eat down in this area, so they're having to move more northernly. Um, we did see the eruption um, of winter finches recently, and that did bring some down, but overall we're seeing the range expanding upwards over time. Additionally, we have some future range projections for certain species. Uh, black oyster catcher, bobolink, and sandhill cranes, these are um, where they expect these species to be moving by 2080 and then where their population was in the 2000s. And so um, one species that's been shifting its range has been the limpkin. And limpkins normally are kind of living only in certain areas of Florida, but because their food, the apple snail, has become an invasive species and spread across the Gulf area, the limpkin has also followed that apple snail's change in range. And so they're actually becoming really common in places like Louisiana, where we never used to see them at all. So birds are definitely, their ranges aren't this thing that's just static and it's always gonna stay the same. It's gonna ebb and flow just like anything else. And it's gonna respond to environmental factors as well. <laughs> Look at that bobble link range. Yeah, it's um, pretty crazy where, where these birds might end up moving to. Uh, there's also been uh, the impact of invasive or non-native species. We did a video about the parrots in Pasadena, California, which have become uh, invasive there, but they're actually slightly imperiled in their native range. And so these are sightings of monk parakeets, red crown Amazons, and Nande parakeets in the United States. So these areas are actually becoming parrot uh, refuge populations. So something did happen in their native range we may have a backup population of these parrots, but they're often very noisy. And so citizens living in these areas get mad at them. So there's this huge debate on like, do we kill them or because they're not native here? Should we eradicate the population? But what if it ends the species? So it's actually causing a lot of controversy as far as what do we do? What's the right move in this situation? Mm -hmm. It's crazy how much things are not only changing in like the technological advances for birds, but like the actual physical ranges of a lot of these birds. Indeed. Um, as far as the current outlook in the future for birds, time is really going to tell what we're able to do. I think there has been a big push for being more environmentally friendly. Of course, the Milwaukee Bucks created a quote unquote bird friendly stadium. And so I think um, that's a big step in the right direction with bigger organizations, bigger you know, corporations pushing for more sustainable buildings 
and um, stuff like that. So I'm proud of Milwaukee for taking steps to encourage preventing window strikes and birds. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we're going to continue to make our content. Uh, we do have a video called uh, How to Use eBird, a Beginner's Guide, if you want to learn more about that. We also did, as Ryan mentioned, a Birder's Guide to Horicon Marsh, where we highlight our favorite places to go. And uh, we were actually at Horicon a couple days ago, and we saw two pairs of whooping cranes there. So that was mm -hmm. a really good sign. to Because I'm always excited to just see one, but to actually see four was pretty incredible as well. Yeah, I think birding is really at an interesting state right now where it could we could see a severe decline in the populations of a lot of birds just as people are starting to get interested but hopefully that increased interest that people are experiencing and the scientific stuff that's going on to help improve birding is going to help a lot of these species mm -hmm. and some thoughts we had for the future was will we see birding take off as a more mainstream hobby will it be weird if you're a kid and you don't bird and explore your natural world um, what will the impact be? Could you ever have too many people birding where it's affecting the population of birds negatively? Or will we see that um, really push conservation efforts and will we see populations rebound as more of a community effort as opposed to just um, the actions of more select individuals in the future? Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that we can say for sure though is that the world of birding definitely has changed in just the last 10 years alone. And I think it's going to continue to change to the point where it's not going to be even the same as is now probably five years from now yeah there are some through lines for sure though um just as you may keep a list um or you know keep a collection of on paper it's more just the means of doing it has changed so it's still kind of the same basic so idea just the, in the a different way the means have changed but the spirit remains the Indeed, same correct um so thanks so much for watching uh you can find our youtube channel on badgerland birding if you search it we also have a blog and um we'll be putting out more content we just got some uh, t-shirts too that we'll be wearing in our videos and you guys you know can purchase those too if you're interested so we'd love to take your guys questions and hear your thoughts about um the world of birding okay so folks can start unmuting themselves and um we you know we'd be happy to take your questions you can either type them into the chat or just um ask the question outright but um be considerate of others that may be talking at the same time. So, so take your time when you're talking so that you're not talking over the top of someone else. So anybody have any questions? Well, this is, this is Carl. I just want to say thank you first. <clears throat> I was absolutely fascinating. I, um, I wish we could bottle your enthusiasm and, uh, and uh, uh, spread it around uh, as widely as possible, but it sounds like you're doing a a very good, uh, very good job of uh, uh, of, of capturing um, the, the the real essence of birding that 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 uh, that's, that spiritual moment when you when you find and identify something that you were really looking for. Um, so that that was really good. I, I also like to shout out to Pokemon um, <laughs> as somebody with a 29 year old son who uh, grew up with Pikachu. Uh, and the rest of the gang, uh, that's, uh, it was a nice analogy. Thanks. Um, we re really appreciate it, Carl. Uh, Jeff and Sue said they've been trying out the Merlin sound app and have had great results. So I think we've kind of heard the same thing that other people have had really good results with the call app so far too. Mm -hmm. yeah, going back to the Pokemon thing too, like I really do think it set the stage for the generation, like our generation to be interested in more stuff like birding. Cause like when you already have that familiarity and that connection, like my first uh, thoughts on it was like, wow, there's something that's really similar to Pokemon I can do in real life. You know, it was like, but I remember back when I was a kid being like, man, if only Pokemon was a real thing, life would be so much more fun. And now I'm kind of like, it sort of is a real thing. I guess the other thing I wanted to note was um, what you talked about, the, your ability to try and, um, the 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 interest that young birders are are having and uh, uh, young the more young people getting into birding and uh, and catching catching this enthusiasm, I I know that there are several members of the club besides me uh, who count it as uh, uh, some of our best experiences when there have been young birders in the club. There have never been a lot. Um, but we're very proud of the fact that uh, several of them have gone on to uh, careers in ornithology um, uh, and uh, and and are making a real a real difference. Um, and I think that's you know that that's something we can all aspire to try and achieve more of. And I hope uh, 
you continue to have success uh, inspiring it in, in, uh, in, other, in other people your age and younger. Any other, any other comments, questions? So there is one in the chat from Jeff and Suze. They basically have said they've tried out the Merlin sound app and have had great results. So uh, anybody else have tried out the Merlin sound app? Looks like mm -hmm. Dennis did. Anybody else? Yep. Go ahead, you ask your question. Go ahead, Casey. I have a question. We're in the West Bend area and I'm hearing a lot of people talking about infections in the birds right now. And we know that there has been a drop in the number of species that used to be in high numbers in our yard. And I'm just wondering what you have heard about that and if that's something we should be concerned about and doing something about. I know there's been a lot of talk with people taking down their bird feeders um, because they're having disease and stuff. I think it's the kind of thing where if you notice, you know, finches with like balding eyes or you're seeing noticeable deterioration of your birds, then you might want to take your feeders down and make sure they're clean. Okay. Um, but I think for the most part, if you're not seeing any disease um, in your area, I think you should be fine. I know it's a good idea to clean them out periodically anyways, yep. though, just to, you know, prevent diseases from spreading. I think also the use of pesticides is something that's uh, starting to take its toll on birds and wild animals in general as well. And then there's also something really recently that happened that scientists are still trying to figure out, but it seems like as soon as the cicadas came out this year, they were experiencing a lot more birds having strange symptoms and they're still unclear on the connection people just huh. noted that this year with this big cicada boom all of a sudden more birds are appearing to be sick um okay. and that they don't know what it is yet but okay. people definitely have been spreading that around as well just the talking about it and trying to figure out what it is mm -hmm. i think that's more in the southern oh. area though oh, yeah. that brood X. south and east right thank you yep sure and and i think Carl even said this before too, the lack of some bird species, a lot of it had to do with the fact that there were snowstorms and cold weather in Texas, you know, in April, just as all those migrants were coming through. It's no different than and when we've had that kind of thing happen here, mm -hmm. you know, um, in late April or early May when we've had the warblers in and suddenly you've got a, you know, a snowstorm or something that, or a couple of days of really cold weather, you know, there aren't any insects. A lot of those migratory birds can't find anything to eat and they start perishing. So, so the lack of some of these, especially the insect eaters, has something to do with the weather that we, we had um, in the in the spring all over the country. So okay. yeah, I was in uh, South Louisiana when that big snowstorm hit, and a lot of the purple martins had nested already, and a oh. lot of them didn't make it. But uh, a lot of the next nest boxes got replenished with others. But you know, that's one whole generation of birds that was nesting already that got wiped out. Yeah, so. I definitely haven't seen the bluebirds this year in numbers at all. Right. I think I've seen a total of like two bluebirds this summer in like one location specifically. And I think a lot of people are missing those because I always look forward yeah. to seeing them back. Yeah, for sure. We had a, uh, an ice storm here two or three years ago in April. And um, I, I know I had, uh, I, I've lived here 14 years and for the first <coughs> 11 or 11 or so years, I always had Phoebe's nesting underneath the footbridge right near here. Um, and they were here, uh, but not they didn't survive the ice storm. And um, they, I, I haven't had Phoebe's back since then. I, there was, there was a, a population that was, you know, a, a keystone with that, uh, with, with that one pair. And once they were gone, there's not, not, there aren't enough Phoebe's around to fill that niche, apparently. So even though the habitat really hasn't changed. Yeah, and you have to wonder if the numbers are going to keep kind of dwindling. But the thing like Derek mentioned about the shifting baseline syndrome is sometimes it happens in such an incremental way that you don't even notice until it's too late. You know, like well, right now we're like, oh, yeah, I haven't seen many bluebirds or Phoebes. But then maybe, you know, 10 years from now, someone will be like, I saw a bluebird this year. It was insane. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the, as the generations go you start to kind of lose track of what becomes normal and whatever is, is the new normal. I'm hoping we don't have another freak blizzard. Let's just give them a break for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like they face so many threats just with like pesticides, cats, everything. Yep, Nino? Nino? Uh, one of the things that's, 
I'm excited about that's really changing fast is uh, the monitoring of bird migration, um, the the transmitters and uh, that are being put on birds and um, that's something it always used to be, oh, I wonder where that bird goes in the winter. <laughs> and now, uh, or soon, we're gonna be knowing a lot more about a lot of birds. I just find that fascinating. It is, I like the Project Snowstorm stuff they do with the snowy owls. So they'll you know, take one and put a transmitter on it. And then uh, you actually later usually see the map of where they go. And it's funny yeah. how they'll kind of like be around an area and all of a sudden one day just boop, like it's way north in one day. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. One of, one of the uh, baseline projects of the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory is to facilitate the erection of a fence of MODIS towers, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, telemetry towers, uh, east-west across the state um, and also north-south along the Lake Michigan shoreline. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, those, those, those tower, that, that fence line is being erected and hopefully it will be able to uh, uh, spur researchers to mount more of these little transmitters on birds um, so that they now that there's a system to track them. Yeah something else too kind of in the same vein is I know they're doing a lot more stuff with uh, monitoring nighttime flight calls so mm -hmm. they're getting more info with that as well and there was a funny story where they had uh, one of those monitoring stations that was like on the border of two states I think it was Kentucky and Tennessee and that they monitored all these crazy flight calls that would have been like first records for the state because you know who knows what goes overhead that you that never lands but the two states were arguing trying to give those calls to the other state because the birders were like well we don't want you know to have that in our state and then have not been able to go see it so they were like no those are those are your flight calls that you have they're trying to argue about who had to take the flight calls <laughs> crazy so dennis you're unmuted now do you want to say something how could you tell I was unmuted? My phone <laughs> going off? <laughs> no, I can, you know, we can see that the icon is gone. So, you know, that, that you should be able to speak. So, and you have. So, what would you like to share with us? First of all, I'm sorry. I kept clicking on unmute and I, it wouldn't work for me before. But, uh, uh, no, I, I just wanted to share uh, something special with the group. Uh, uh, Believe it or not, fall migration has already uh, begun for some species of birds. Uh, one of the first groups of birds to start migrating south are the shorebirds. And with that in mind, I'd like to invite everyone uh, that might be interested to join us for our last field trip of the year. It is scheduled for Sunday, August 22nd, and it's our annual shorebird trip to Horicon Marsh. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll run into Ryan and his brother out there. I don't know. Um, our plans are to rendezvous at 7 a.m. at the east end of Old Marsh Road. Uh, I hope people would like to join us on that day. It usually turns out to be a very nice field trip. Uh, Carl and I will be sending Carl and I will be sending out uh, an email. Uh, as we get a little closer to that date with uh, a reminder and, and more information on that. There's really good shorebird habitat right now on uh, Old Marsh Road on that side that you guys are starting at. And the pectorals are back already too. We saw some of those there the other day. We're looking forward to the trip. WSO has a similar field trip uh, one week prior to that. So if anybody uh, keeps track and, and wants to register on the WSO site for that trip. There's that that available as well. But as Dennis said, we will get out a, a uh, an emailed invitation to everybody as well uh, for 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 that. Um, I want to make uh, just two other two other mentions. Um, um, I want to let people know that uh, I sent a check the other day uh, to uh, Pine View Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. Um, we've, I look back through our records, we've given uh, $250 a year to Pine View. Uh, uh, I, I look back through 2014, so we've been pretty faithful about that. And so I sent them a check for that for our yearly support for, uh, for their wildlife, particularly their raptor uh, re rehab efforts. Um, and I also just received, um, I think we talked about this two meetings ago, uh, after Tom Stolp of uh, uh, from the Ozaki Washington Land Trust um, made uh, his report on uh, what the land trust is up to and specifically 
on their um, uh, clay, um, Cedar Gorge uh, Clay Bluffs uh, acquisition efforts along Lake Michigan. Uh, there have been further, further uh, positive developments on that front. <clears throat> and the Bird Club has made its uh, a, an additional contribution. I received a, a thank you letter from the land trust the other day uh, for the $500 we sent. Um, and a special note from Tom noting that uh, the Bird Club was among the very first to donate to that uh, original acquisition attempt uh, seven years ago. That's how long they've been working at trying to acquire this property. Uh, seven years ago, uh, feeling, feeling flush after the dissolution of the Badger Meter Credit Union um, and uh, uh, Sue Grota, our treasurer at the time, was reported that we had received a, a dividend on the, on the dissolution of that credit union. And we sent $2,000 of, of that off to the land trust um, to continue our support for the land trust acquisition, acquisition of key properties along Michigan, Lake Michigan, including previously the Lions Den and Forest Beach Migratory Preserve acquisitions. So anyway, um, um, I, I put together a, a report on uh, on how much we've uh, we've done. If anybody wants to see what we've been using our money for, uh, and, and support of speakers and uh, and other uh, conservation efforts. Um, I've got a report together and I will email, I'm not going to send it out to everybody, but anybody who wants it, please let me know and I will be glad to send you a copy of it. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's all for tonight. If anybody else has any other new business, oh, I, I should mention one thing. Um, so our next meeting uh, will be um, September 7th and um, our presenter is going to be uh, Kristen Geese, who is the executive director of the Mequon Nature Preserve, uh, which is now a 444 acre preserve uh, that was originally started by the Ozaki Washington Land Trust. Um, now it's a, a city of Mequon property uh, with its own uh, uh, NGO to run it and, uh, and do a lot of wonderful things for habitat restoration. Um, and conservation education. So um, uh, Kristen is, uh, is a really neat, uh, neat person and uh, I, th I think uh, you'll enjoy that program as well. So we're looking forward to that uh, on the first Tuesday in September. Um, and again, I wanna thank Ryan and Derek very much for their presentation and we'll be sending them along our honor an honorarium and uh, very grateful for what has I think been one of the most interesting programs uh, we've had we've had all year, and uh, uh, a tribute to their uh, imagination and uh, and talent. So, thank you very much, guys. A well, wonderful presentation. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you guys so much for having us. Yeah, uh, and with that, um, I think uh, are we all set, Mary? Anything else? No, I think that's it for this evening. Good seeing well, all good of you. Join Good us night. again next Thanks month. And look forward to you, see, seeing you all next month. Bye, all. Good night. Bye.